Just wanted to remind us all that uh, I believe Linda has, has a children's church prepared, if that is something you would like. And if you saw the kids not coming back after, after they go out there, you're thinking to yourself, you first time in the church, why, well, I wonder what they do with the kids. <laughs> well, uh, there is potluck, and um, <clears throat> there is the story of Hansel and Gretel, so don't think that. Anyway. I was cycling this week, as I do most every week, uh, inside at the club that I go to. And um, uh, I have a teacher who pushes us very hard. And I keep going back to that class because she pushes us very hard. Part of what I do in order to be able to accomplish What she is suggesting would be the optimal uh, exercise revolutions, you know, I'm watching those go, uh, my, my cadence, I'm trying to keep my cadence up. And so I have to concentrate because there's music going and a lot of the time it's, it's music that, uh, I could use beat of the music, I could use that, but a lot of times it's too slow, because she's saying, okay, push, push, I want you to do 105, I want you to do 106, and you're thinking, is that miles per hour? (laughs) I wish it it was, man, my hair would be going back, no, no, this is, this is pedal strokes. Okay, so you're, 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 you're going and you're going. So the way that I get through this is that I have to concentrate. Well, this week, I was concentrating on a piece of the bicycle that was in front of me, and suddenly I realized it had a little sign on it. Now, these are all stationary bicycles. These are, these are heavy-duty, you know, industrial, meant to be used by hundreds of people every week. So the manufacturer had put onto this bicycle a little sign. And the very first word was, CAUTION! (laughs) And it suddenly came to me what I wanted to tell you today. CAUTION! It may be hazardous for your health to be a Christian. How many times, how many times this week were you tempted to not be a Christian? It is actually what we are told mostly by this world and completely by the culture that we live in today. It basically says, you're not going to make it if you're a Christian. More and more, uh, when, when there are statements made by various groups in the world, they'll say, if you're Muslim, it's great. If you're Buddhist, it's great. If you're Thai Buddhist, it's, it's really good. That's, that's my friend Amy. She's Thai Buddhist. That's even better. Uh, if, if you are animist, it's great. If you're New Age, that's great. But if you're Christian, we don't want to hear from you. And I, I have friends who, you know, kind of bemoan this fact of our world today. And I do say to them, you know, well, you know, we've had several thousand years to tell people what it's like to be Christian by the way that we act. It hasn't gone so well hasn't gone so well. And, and, and you know, I, you, you've heard me say this before. The fact is that I believe we often earn the right to be called hypocrites. So when I saw that sign, well, I'm trying so hard to keep up my cadence, you know, because she told us we had to do this at gear 17. Okay, so this is not easy, and we're not allowed to stand up. So we're... uh, 
Caution! Riding this bicycle may be hazardous to your health. You, you, you may just keel over. Actually, you may just fall off because you're trying so hard and suddenly something breaks and, and what you thought was stable is not stable. I don't know if, you've, if you have contemplated the fact that Jesus came, he is God, he came to give the world the message that he had been trying to give that to, to, through, the, through the Israelite people and his relationship with them. He came to try and give it in person and we killed him. So I don't know. I don't know if you've stopped recently to think about the fact that caution... Following Jesus, following in his footsteps, may be hazardous to the life that everyone else who doesn't care about Jesus, who doesn't want to listen to Jesus, might be telling you is going to cause you to fail, is going to cause you to, to not be successful in the world. So here you are, you, you, you show up this morning, and, and I'm so glad to see all your bright and shining faces. Thank you. Uh, it, it gives me an opportunity to smile at you and to tell you how much I love you. And it also gives God that opportunity as well through what you say to each other. And when you see each other, please greet each other, as the Bible says, with a handshake, a hug, a holy kiss, whatever the other person is comfortable with. We just sang the eighth song in our hymnal. We gather together, what? To ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens his will to make known. The wicked, who, who, who are the wicked? This is, this is, a, this is a hymn, this is a, a Christian hymn, and here we're talking about us and them. We're talking about those of us who have accepted Jesus, and then we're also talking about those who, who say no and, and say, God, go away from me. I don't want you in my life by their actions, maybe not, even, not, not so much by their thoughts, but they, they are classed in, in this song by Anonymous, 1625, as wicked. The wicked oppressing now cease from distressing. Sing praises to the name. He forgets not his own. Here we gather together on a weekly basis. We come together. Paul says, the Apostle Paul says, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together. Why? Because we need support. We need support in believing that even though the rest of the world is saying, caution, being a Christian could be hazardous to the kind of life that we think you should be living. Buy a new Ford. Uh, you know, buy a house or you know, make sure you go shopping at Nordstrom. Everybody's saying, live this life, live this life over here, over there. And here we are singing, we gather together to seek the Lord's blessing. We're tuning out, as many people who are leading out from this pulpit say at the beginning of our service. Now just let go, tune out all of that noise that's saying, what are you doing here? Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you trust God? It's going to end badly for you. And you're thinking, wow, <laughs> pastor, <laughs> kind of laying it on thick there, aren't you? <laughs> but I bet I could point to any one of you and you could stand up right now and say, because I am a Christian this week, I didn't and then you could fill in the blank. And my friends did. In fact, they asked me to go with them. Even if it was a text. 
even if it was a phone call and they weren't physically there. There are pressures that each of us face every week to go another road. So again, I want to, I want to say thank you for trusting that coming to church today would encourage you to keep on the pathway to heaven. Because that's what I hope coming to church does for you every time you come to the Santa Clarita Seventh-day Adventist Church. I honestly am, and, and, and I cannot vouch for any other place because I'm not there helping to make happen what happens here. But I do know some good people in the Southern California Conference of Seventh-day Adventists that put their life blood into doing this so that there can be a place where people can come and be encouraged and be told, you know what, the world has been telling you all week, caution, being a Christian could be hazardous to your health. But we know better. We know better. How, how, how do I tie this in? Well, take your Bibles or your phones out, depending on where you have your Bible. And I know some of you have it on your phone. And those, those of you who don't have your Bible on your phone, please, uh, this afternoon, figure it out. Download a Bible app onto your phone, okay, so that you can use your Bible all the time with you because I know you're using your phone. And turn to Isaiah. I say Isaiah. You say Isaiah. Tomato, tomato. Okay. 53, he who, who has believed our message? Isaiah, what on earth are you saying? He's basically saying the message that has come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the saints, and all the people of Israel. How well are we doing? We could say the Adventist message. Well, how well are we doing? Went to a pastor meeting recently, and the speaker there, who was there to encourage us, first he, he basically said, you know what, um, those 20, what, 22 million Adventists that we think we have, how many of them actually show up on a Sabbath morning? And all of us pastors, I'm sorry, I mean, for a church where we have over 200 people on the books, there are not 200 people here this morning. And there's a vast ma a majority of you who may not even be on the books of this church. So if I had to be asked this morning, how many, Pastor, how many of your church members came to church this morning? I would have to say probably 75 of those that, that have their names on the books of the church. So of 22 million Adventists in the world, how many do you think are really en engaged, really interested in knowing whether or not the message of the Seventh-day Adventist church is going forward and are really interested in getting together with other people who are, are, are wanting to do what God has asked the Seventh day Adventist Church to do. And, you know, we were sitting there as pastors going, Yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. It's really only about 10 or 11 million, right? So, how many, raise your hand if you know how many Christians there are in the whole world? 1.2 billion out of eight. Okay. How many of those are Protestant? A few million. And then, how many of those are Adventist? Oh, well, about 22 million. Out of 1.2 billion, that's 1,000 million if you're English. A billion is 1,000 million. So 12,000 million people in the world are Christian. And we want to say, yippee, we've got 22 million. Okay? Now do you want to read Isaiah 53 verse 1 again with me? Who has believed our message? And who has the arm of the Lord and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And here we go. Here comes Isaiah with his prophetic uh, 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 picture of what Jesus would be to this culture in this world at this time. 
So if you're feeling bad about being a Christian today, look at this description of what Jesus would be. Believe me, he would not be on the front cover of GQ. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised. Can you feel the weight of that word? He was despised and rejected by men, by humanity. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Are you hearing me this morning when I see that sign on that bicycle and it says, Caution! You're going to be despised. You're going to be rejected. Not going to be too good for your social health. And then I point to the cross. And you know, we, we want very much to love the cross, but let's be real for a moment. It scares us. Just like a caution sign tells us, oh, wait, think about this. Think about this. Like one whom men hide their faces from, the second part of verse 3, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And I'm glad that the, I'm glad that the writer of Isaiah at this point says, we. Because if you think, if you think that, that you can just put this on someone else or some other follower or some other follower group of God, then, then I would ex, you know, in, encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to, to get you to include yourself this morning. Because that's what I'm saying. When, when that moment of that sign sunk into my brain, I said, Th this, this is what I have to warn my congregation about. Surely he took out our infirmities and carried away our sorrows, yet we considered him, we considered him stricken by God. Quick, what was the story? What, what story would you, would you think the disciples, this is a disciple story, uh, the disciples were with Jesus one day and the rich guy came up to him and said, I've done everything right. And he was rich and they could see that he was rich. Uh, is there anything else that you would recommend that I do so that I can receive heaven? Okay, so I'm going to stop the picture for a moment. What were the disciples thinking at that moment? Rich, finish the sentence. Rich equals? Rich equals blessed by God. Poor equals? What did the Bible just say Jesus was? Stricken. Slapped. Smacked. By God. So here's this guy. He's coming up to Jesus and he's saying, I want to be one of your disciples. And the rest of the disciples who were poor fishermen were going, oh, cool. The guy from Valencia wants to be part of our church. Okay. He lives in Stevenson Ranch. Oh, that would be great. You know, he doesn't live in... You know, the other side of Newhall Avenue, down in Newhall. He, he lives in... That's what they're thinking. And when they're listening to Jesus, he said, you know, have you done this? Have you... Yes, I've done that since I was a boy, the guy says. And now the disciples are going, oh yeah, he's a shoe-in. And then Jesus says, what I'm going to say to you now. Sell it all. The people who put those caution signs in your life, who say to be this and this and this is success. 
Sell it all. Get rid of it. The Apostle Paul later on calls it a pile of dung. The way you think, the processing, the things that you, that, 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 that you believe that make you do what you do. Jesus says to this guy, sell it all. The, uh, the apostles, the disciples' jaws were on the floor. They thought this guy was this close to heaven. God had blessed him. They were believing in a, a, a teaching, an understanding of the kingdom of God that had been propagated for centuries. And Jesus was saying, um, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you, And, and, and the disciples were just were probably inwardly going, no, 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 don't go, don't go, don't go. And here goes, here goes the rich young ruler. The Bible says he walked away. And we never hear any more about that guy. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying, please, please understand me. I'm not saying that rich equals evil and poor equals good. That's what I'm not saying. I am saying, believing that rich is blessing from God only, and that if you haven't attained riches by the way that the world counts riches, that you have not been blessed by God. Like, you know, if you were to play the lottery every week and say, God is going to bless me. And I'm sure, you see, this, this, is, this, is, this is what many people think, and, and, and I, I try to be kind to them, but I'm going to say, God is not the big vending machine in the sky. I put in my tithe, and out comes the blessings, right? No. Are you reading? 53 with me? Let's, let's read it again. Surely he took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows, yet he was cons we, we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. Our transgressions. What are our transgressions? Our transgressions are not believing in God. Not trusting God. Not listening to God when he says, this is the way that I want you to go, and you don't know why, and you can't see the, the way ahead, and you're saying, God, I can't see ahead, and, and so because I can't see ahead, I, I, I don't know if I want to go that way. And then he says, have faith, my son. Have faith, my sister. What does the Bible say? If you can see it, do you have to have faith in it? No. Faith is the essence of things not seen. See how that, I mean, you know this. But then the question is in our lives, do we do this? Do we, are, are, are we interested in doing what he asks us to do and saying, being a part of his kingdom being, or are we going to be like the rich young ruler saying, I did it all. I put in everything that I was supposed to put in and now you're supposed to give me heaven. I don't know if this is going to mess with you, but I have, as a pastor, had many experiences where people pleaded with me not to take their children's name off the books of the church. In fact, it was my own mother when the church wanted to take my brother's name off the books. No, he's, he's not a practicing Adventist. He knows about God. He was raised in the same family. 
But there is this unspoken idea that if your name is on the books of the church, somehow God is going to give you heaven. I've got news for you, brothers and sisters. I've got news for you. If you're a visitor here, and this is the first time you've heard me speak, sorry, it doesn't come out like this every week, but it did this week. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. But I have a, I have a, I'm going to use a big word here, you ready? Fiduciary. Some of you know that word. I don't really know it all, but... Fiduciary means I have an obligation to tell you that the world out there thinks you're crazy. If you believe in Jesus Christ today, if you, if you are committed to following Jesus and, and, and to living in his kingdom and to living by the principles of his kingdom, they think you're crazy. They put a caution stamp on your forehead. Wherever you go, they avert their eyes from you. They don't want to look at you. Because if you're going to be like Jesus, then you are going to be treated the same way that he was treated. So yeah, I know there are those who, who, uh, who want to say when, when people treat them badly for being a Christian, yeah, you see, you see, I, I'm, I'm being persecuted for God. I really have to close my mouth at that time, usually, because sometimes it's, I'm, you're just being persecuted because you're being silly. You, you really are. You, you didn't have to do what you did. But you did it thinking that this was what you needed to do in order to please God. But you really hadn't talked to him about it. You really didn't know that this is what he wanted you to do. So, here we are gather together. Let's turn to the next text that we are looking at today. Uh, 60, 61. Isaiah 61. Okay. Ten points for the Bible student of the New Testament, the Gospels particularly, who can tell me when Jesus spoke these words and where. And it can't be Eric who tells me. Oops. Sorry, Eric. Anyone? When did Jesus speak these exact words? Quote, in fact, he was reading from the Isaiah scroll. When? Where, where was he? Let's ask that question. He was in synagogue, so he's in church. Yes? Where? In his hometown, which was... Not his birth town, his hometown. He was in Nazareth. And the Bible says, as was his custom, we as church-going people love to throw that at people who don't come to church, right? You know, if you want to be like Jesus, you've got to come to church. It's got to be your custom too, right? Well, have you ever stopped to ask why the custom was a good one? I'm telling you today, if you've had trouble in church, if you've had trouble this last week, it's a good thing to come to church because there are people here who are going to pray with you if you need. There are people here who are going to love on you. There are people here, and I'm talking to the real members here. Let's make sure this happens, hey? Every week, someone you don't know, make sure that they leave knowing that Jesus loves them. And if you're just a visitor here today and you want to do that for somebody else, please do. This is the environment. We gather together to seek the Lord's blessing in this place. So be the blessing. Jesus is in Nazareth. They give him the scroll. He's this new upstart rabbi. And they're thinking, let's give him the Isaiah scroll. What a blessing. What a, what a, what a wonderful honor to be the one to read in church. The Spirit of the Lord, the Sovereign Lord. Okay? And it's capital L-O-R-D in your Bibles, right? I told Sister today that when you see capital L-O-R-D, that is the word for Yahweh. That's the translation time for Yahweh. 
The Spirit of Yahweh is on me because Yahweh has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Why the poor? And why later on in five, in Matthew 5 does he say, blessed are the poor? Here's the kicker. Blessed are those who are poor by the standards of this evil empire in this evil world. How's that? Blessed are you when you Seventh-day Adventists believe Revelation 14, 7 says, pay attention to the God of creation. One of the ways you can pay attention is by worshiping him on the seventh day of creation, on the Sabbath which he created. Pay attention to him. Let him be the leader of your life. Don't let the evil empire be the leader of your life. That's our message. Did you know that? <laughs> Are you worried now that you're a Seventh-day Adventist? Maybe you should be. Because you're basically claiming with Revelation 14.7 that this world is not following the creator God of the universe. Is not honoring the creator God of the universe. And that there are vast numbers of Christians who are not honoring the God of the universe, even the God of the Old Testament, who now some of my favorite people that I have been listening to all of my ministry are saying, we don't need the Old Testament. We don't need the Ten Commandments. We just need the one in the, in the New Testament that says love one another. This is the day and age in which we live. They want to put a stamp on your forehead saying, caution, those Adventists. Watch out. They don't believe that you believe in the same God they do. Well, maybe. Maybe. Maybe we don't. He, Yahweh, has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Have you ever considered that your mission this week if we all played Mission Impossible, because it is an impossible mission, that your mission this week will be to bind up a broken heart on behalf of the God of the universe. And I mean a heart that has been broken by the evil empire who has promised that heart all kinds of things in this world and then never delivered. Used and used like a doormat by the evil empire, trampled on. And along comes you and says, you know what? There is a God who created you, who loves you, who wants you to live forever in his presence. You want to go? You want to go? Come on. Isn't that it, wouldn't that be good news? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that broken heart suddenly, potentially, through the power of the Holy Spirit, have the ability once again to trust? And isn't that what he is calling us to do as we go out into this mission? Today, Jesus stands up in church and he says, my mission is to take these broken hearts and to heal them back to the Father. To proclaim freedom for the captives. My friends, we could be here for a long time talking about what is captivating our friends, what is captivating us. And release from darkness for the prisoners. Prisoners in their own minds. Darkened by their own decisions. Read Revelation, excuse me, read Romans chapter 1, and you'll know what Paul is talking about. These are people who see God, who turn away, and then their minds are darkened. Does God give up on them? No. Should we give up on them? No. They're prisoners in their, in their own minds, prisoners of their own ideas that have kept them. And to comfort those who mourn, oh, let's not forget this one. 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God. And please understand, God is going to come back, and he's coming back, we believe, very soon. I've decided that even if it's not in my lifetime, I don't care. Used to think it would be better to walk into the kingdom than to be resurrected. Don't think that anymore. Because this, my friends, this moment, this moment is part of your eternity if you have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If, you are, if you're part of his kingdom, if you're living as part of his kingdom, right now is part of your eternal life. We preach this at funerals, and we should be preaching it like I'm doing right now every week. It's the good news that even if you die, yep, some of us are going to die. That's what happens in the valley of the shadow of death. Yet we will also live would that not be good news? So when we preach the day of God's vengeance, the day of God's judgment, we should be preaching it with joy and with anticipation because that's the day he's going to put everything right. And we can tell our friends the tough things that are going on in your life are going to be put right. Is that not something to look forward to? Yes. The evil empire will be overthrown. God's empire will be the only one. He will bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Are you, are you hearing a litany of situations that you know about? You, each of you, could put names to these situations, people who are in despair, people who are downhearted, people who need to know that he's going to change things. I guess you could say we gathered here together today to seek the Lord's blessing. Blessing for the power of the Holy Spirit to, to be within us, so that we could say the same things that Jesus says, I've come that you may have life. Choose life. Don't choose this death culture that is telling you all sorts of things, telling you how to live. Don't choose this death culture, he says. Choose life. Life eternal. Live your life in this part of your eternal life like you know it's your eternal life. And you know what that's going to mean? It's going to mean that we can be generous. And I'm not just talking about with the church. I'm talking about with each other. That space that, that you think that you should have in the traffic, give it to somebody else. You'll still get home. Maybe without a fender bender. Bonus. <laughs> We can be generous. We can be compassionate. We can, we can see that person in need and take the time to help them. Now, why do I say this? Well, because you see, I believe in a big God. I believe in a God who's going to come back and change everything. And I believe that he has the capacity to change me right now and to change anyone else who wants to be changed. And to join them into this kingdom where we can live on his riches. Do you ever think that you're going to go hungry? Or not have enough money to do whatever it is that he wants you to do? Dare I remind you of the time that Jesus had to pay taxes. What did he tell Peter to do? It's tax season, so I've got to tell the story. Go down to the lake... Get that fish, Peter comes back with the fish, open its mouth, <laughs> and what did he find inside? A two drachma coin, the tax, to the penny, that was necessary in order to pay Caesar what Caesar deserved. He provided it. 
out of the mouth of a fish. So are you going to be worried this week? Oh, I hope I get a good tax return. Because I've got bills to pay. Maybe you should be thinking, you know what, I've got bills to pay because I overspent. And because I did things that I didn't need to do. Maybe things that I didn't even ask God about. So maybe there's a little repentance that happens during tax season. I don't know. Maybe it's just the need for us to recommit to the fact that God is our leader and we need to follow him. What do you say? They called him a fool. They called him the April fool. When he was on that cross. Do you want to be an April fool? Caution. It may be hazardous to the life that everybody says you should have, but it will end up in eternity. Amen. Amen. Amen.